So Dr. Stripling, come on up. Dr. Scott Stripling is the, his, his big claim to fame is he's my friend. No, his real claim to fame is he is the director of the largest archeological dig in Israel, Shiloh. Of all places, like if there's any place you'd wanna dig in Israel, it would be Shiloh. And he gets to lead it and he gets headed up. Uh, we've had Dr. Stripling on in Grace. We actually did a segment called Stump the Archaeologist. <laughs> and I'm going to do that tonight. I looked through my office shelves and I found this. So I just kind of took over Dad's office. I don't even know all the stuff he has. I didn't even know he had this. So Dr. Scott Stripling, first welcome to Quentin Road Baptist Church. You've been here all week lecturing and teaching and all of that. So we're glad to have you. Thank Let's you. welcome Dr. Stripling. Thank you. And if he... If he can tell us what this is, you can give him another applause. <laughs> well, thank you for this gift. That's very kind of you. That's amazing. Um, we do work with pottery constantly. Um, I've probably examined several million pieces of, of pottery. So just like an entomologist, a bug expert, you know, can tell you everything there is to know about it. bugs. Um, a ceramicist can tell you about pottery. So anyway, let's see what we have here. The we, we are interested in the rim. Does it evert? Does it invert? Or is it straight up? The type of handle attachment, the wear, the, the point, and <clears throat> very likely Iron Age II, which would be the period of the divided kingdom. You know, I'd have to look at it in more depth, but very likely that. Is and authentic, though? Uh, it is authentic, and it probably came from a tomb. You want to know how I know that? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, because it's not broken. It's very rare to have an unbroken vessel at an archaeology. Like one, we get one per year or something like that at our dig. But most of these, if they're unbroken like this, they came from a tomb. Yes. Dead people. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Now, he, he didn't tell you that when we did this on TV, they were bringing out all these things and showing me that I'd never seen before, and they had been told the date of them and that I was getting them all right, okay? Correct? You did. All right, got them all right. <laughs> it's a joy to be with you. Thank you for your hospitality, Pastor Jim, and the, the students, the staff, it just, been, just had a wonderful time, um, fed me a lot of food and I have fed the students a lot of information, and some of them are here tonight, just you know, gluttons for punishment and begging for more, but it has been a, a, just a really good time. Um, we're grateful for you hosting our museum exhibit. Um, when I say our, I mean the Associates for Biblical Research. I am the provost at a seminary in Houston, and one of our programs is a master's in biblical history and archeology span that I am very hands-on with, but then I oversee the other programs as well. Then I am the director of excavations for the Associates for Biblical Research, which is a consortium. We have about 15 universities and schools of different types that are part of that consortium. And I am working on getting another one with Dayspring, I hope. I really want to see a Dayspring group at our uh, dig in the near future. So I'll be praying with you for the Lord's provision and uh, it would be a life-changing and a wonderful event. And you're already bought in, really, to what we're doing. I mean, the fact that you brought our exhibit here, and I'm so sorry that the year unfolded the way that it did, and you weren't able to fully appreciate the, the exhibit because of all the COVID stuff. But here we are, we're still standing, all right? And, and the exhibit is, is, is gonna move on to North Carolina next month, and you know, hopefully be a blessing to people over there. Uh, just a few things I'll point out. This is an Iron Age one period of the judges cook pot. Cook pots broke because they were handled a lot. They were put on the fire. So, you know, something that would commonly be replaced. You would think that being a potter would be a good living, but actually it really was not so much. Um, it was kind of a lower, lower middle class, if you will, kind of a, a lifestyle, certainly a blue collar living. Um, but you would think people are breaking their pottery constantly. And then you have the commandments in Leviticus 11, Leviticus 15, when your pottery becomes impure, says the Lord, you must break it. As if we don't have enough broken pottery already in Israel. I mean, we excavate 2,000 pieces a day. So as if we don't have enough broken, now we've got God commanding the Israelites to break their pottery when it becomes impure. And you know, it's very complicated. Um, 
so this is sort of period of the, the judges. This would be period of Joshua and the conquest. And this is an infant burial was in here. I'm going to show you pictures tonight. A neonate, a newborn, was buried inside this jar um, before Joshua and the Israelites arrived at, at Ai. And the dipper juglet was found uh, next to it. And this is always part of their burial ritual in the Bronze Age. And we really don't understand Canaanite religion completely, but they had a way that they understood the afterlife and how you transition from one to the other. And so I think this was some sort of a, a baptism or oil or water or something that was poured. But anytime you find an infant burial, which is unique to that time period, you'll find a dipper jugglet next to it. So I know it has something to do with their cultic usages. <clears throat> we found hundreds of sling stones and these are heavy, and they, if you're hit with one, you are going to be hurt, believe me. And with a sling, they can be thrown 150 miles an hour, and this is a sling made out of wool. And so they were good with these things. I mean, those, those guys that practice constantly, um, and we have hundreds of these, and many of them in the gate of eye, which is where the battle, according to the Bible, took place. So we've published all of those. We're preparing our final volumes of publication now uh, that will come out in April. I'm going to show you pictures of this scarab. This was voted the number one find in Israel in the year 2013. And you wonder what in the world could be so important about this little bitty thing. So I'm going to tell you about that tonight. And then this is a, a Middle Bronze Age. When, when I say Middle Bronze Age, I'm talking about the, the end of the Middle Bronze Age, say 1650 to 1550, the, the Canaanite period at Shiloh, but a very beautiful uh, piece with the strap handle on it. And then these socket stones are really special because they come from the fortress of Ai, and the Bible talks about the gate of Ai. So we literally uncovered the gate, as you're going to see, and these were the first two socket stones from that gate. This is the lower one, this is the upper one, and a post would connect the two together. Remember in Proverbs, it says that a lazy man pivots on his bed like a door pivots on its post. So in other words, he just rolls over. He won't get out of bed and go to work. That's the, the illustration. So the post is pivoting. And when it wears through, which occasionally happens, like this one, guess what they use them for when they wear through? This would be toilets, okay? Uh, so just... Necessity being the mother of invention and all. Thank you for the nice things that you said about me, Jim. I wish my wife would have been here to hear them. Um, spoke with her earlier today. Uh, speaking of wives, you know, Agatha Christie, the great novelist and mystery writer, mystery on uh, murder on the Orient Express and so forth. She was actually married to a very renowned archaeologist, and she spent a lot of time on archaeological digs at Ur. Uh, I mean, her husband was working at Ur, and uh, it was a tremendous excavation. So she worked and was very active and she weaves all that into her, into her stories. But anyway, she was once asked, what is the greatest thing about being married to an archeologist? She thought about it for a moment and she said, the older I get, the more interesting he finds me. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's talk about the problem of I. I, 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 what are we gonna do? We have a problem on our hands, and the problem is this. According to the experts, archaeology contradicts the Bible. And coming out of World War II, we had Kathleen Kenyon excavate at Jericho. And even though the previous dig at Jericho had found a perfect alignment with a biblical text, Kenyon announced to the world when she finished her dig at Jericho in the 1950s, that there was nobody home. When the Bible says that the conquest happened, there was nobody there. Those walls were Middle Bronze Age walls, not Late Bronze Age walls. Can't trust the biblical account. Now, quite frankly, I don't care. I agree that they're Middle Bronze Age walls. I don't care when they were built. All I care is when they fell. You see, that's called a straw man argument, making it seem like we're arguing something that we're not arguing. Walls will stand for thousands of years sometimes. I mean, we excavate walls that are, that are still from that period of Joshua that are still standing. So the fact that they're Middle Bronze Age walls doesn't mean anything. But boy, did the media love it. When Kenyon told him you couldn't trust the Bible, th that skepticism set in, and we had a whole generation followed by a second generation, followed by now a third generation of preachers who were trained with the idea that you do not have a reliable biblical text. Our 
founder of the Associates for Biblical Research, David Livingston, was not blessed by this development. And it got even worse in the 1960s when Joseph Calloway came, came along. I used to call him a good Baptist. I'll just call him a Baptist. Um, Calloway came along from Southern Seminary and excavated at a site called Et Tel, which they believed was I, A-I or I of Joshua 7 and 8, the second site of the conquest. After Calloway excavated there in the 1960s, he announced to the world, nobody was here when the Bible says that the Israelites conquered Jericho. <clears throat> you can't trust the biblical account. Now listen, folks, if you lose Jericho and you lose I, you've lost the conquest. And if you don't have a historical context, you don't have a historical Bible. And all you have are a bunch of myths. Wow. No wonder so many people are skeptical about the biblical text and they're all using archaeology as a club to beat us over the head with. Well, remember what Proverbs 17 says, the first one to present his case sounds right until another comes along and another has come along. <laughs> And we have engaged in the arena of ideas, and we are making tremendous advancement in telling the story of the synchronization between the archaeological data and the biblical text. In fact, we are leading the way technologically. We are evangelical believers, and we're very out front about that, yet we are leading the way scientifically. And for much of the world, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> they don't understand that how this can possibly be. So David Livingston said, we've got a problem here. I don't think the problem is the Bible. I think there's something going on in the archeology. span Maybe we're looking in the wrong time or the wrong place and finding the wrong stuff, but let's examine it. After 40 years of excavation in the West Bank of Israel, I believe that the problem of I is solved. And that's what I'll talk to you about tonight. The early explorers like Edward Robinson came to I. They were, he was told to, that Kermit el Makater, the site that we excavated 10 miles north of Jerusalem, which was very close to Et Tel, the site that Callaway had excavated, uh, he was told that that was the site of I, but he says, I don't think so. There's only a church here. Well, if he'd have walked about 50 more yards, he would have come over the hill and he would have seen the ancient ruins. He barely missed them. Then we have a man named W.F. Albright. We call him the father of biblical archaeology. And Albright, in 1963, was asked by David Livingston if there was any possibility that Et Tel was not I, were there any other candidate sites? And here's what Albright said. Now, when someone refers to himself in the third person, usually that person is full of himself, okay? <laughs> Albright was a genius, and he knew it. And here's what he said. Since the writer, referring to himself, has scoured the district in question in all directions, hunting for ancient sites. He can attest the fact that there is no other possible candidate for I than et tel. No chance. I've scoured the hills and I know everything, so don't even bother looking. Well, Albright missed it also. That's called hubris, by the way, pride which leads to the downfall. You can see here a map of the region north of the Dead Sea, and I'll mark for you the site of Shittim, Joshua 2.1, Joshua 3.1, Numbers 25.1. This is where the Israelites encamped in the final six months or so of the 40-year period. Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy there, then he went up on Mount Nebo and died. Joshua takes over leadership here at Shittim, and they cross over the Jordan River, and they come to Gilgal. Now, I, I worked for six years at that site of Shittim, excavating there. So, I, you know, I've seen it from both sides. I, I worked in Jordan and, you know, looking at the conquest and excavating a conquest site. Now, for many years in Israel, looking across to the other side. And it's given me, I think, a unique perspective. So they camp at Gilgal. And from Gilgal, they go to Jericho, Joshua 6. And the walls of Jericho fall. And then from Jericho, they go up into the hill country following the Wadi Kelt to a little place called Ai. Joshua didn't even need to send the whole army, did he? I'll just send a few men up there because it's a small place and we'll, we'll, we'll mop up on them. Now they had been told by Moses before his death, when you enter into the land that the Lord your God is going to give you and you gain a foothold, then you're going to go north to Shechem, ancient Shechem where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had their roots with Mount Gerizim on one side, the mountain of the blessing, Mount Ebal, the mountain of the curse on the other side, and you're going to renew covenant with me there after you gain a foothold. So there's three phases of the conquest. There's this, this Shittim, Gilgal, Jericho, I, gaining a foothold. 
Then there's the Southern campaign and then there's the Northern campaign. All this takes about six or six and a half years. So from 1446 to 1406, they're in the wilderness. From 1406 to 1400, we have that initial phase of the conquest. And ultimately then they arrive at Shiloh, the site that we are excavating and they erect the tabernacle there in about 1400. So this area you can see, Mount Ival, Mount Gerizim, Shechem, the things that we're talking about. And here is Shiloh right in the middle, about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. You can see another aerial of the, the, the region with the sites that I've been mentioning. What I want to do is quickly look with you this evening at topographical, geographical, and archaeological requirements. Guess where we get these? We get them from the Bible. My argument, as you will read it, uh, Google my name if you're still using Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever you use, and you will get a jillion articles that are going to pop up on the Times of Israel, the Jerusalem Post, and Fox News and the New York Times and all this, and I tell everybody the same thing. With most of these sites, I, I have nothing uh, against the literature from Egypt or Mesopotamia. I mean, we study that. The Ugaritic literature, the Ebla letters, the Amarna letters, all that literature is important to me, and so is the Bible. And with most of these sites, if you're excavating in that part of the world, the Bible is your go-to source. That's our number one source. And I would be a hypocrite to not Acknowledge that. And so I do. I'm very forward with the media. <clears throat> when we're talking about a site like I, it's not mentioned in Egypt. It's not mentioned in Mesopotamia. All we have is the Bible. And guess what? The Bible has proven itself to be very reliable as a historical text. And I'm not saying they, they were setting out necessarily to write history, but the details preserved in the text itself have proven to be very historically reliable. So let's look at a few of them. First of all, it has to be strategically important. It has to be near Beth Aven, Joshua 7 2, east of and near Bethel, Joshua 7 2 again. There has to be an ambush site between Bethel and Ai. And as you read the Bible, you'll never find Bethel and Ai separated. It's always Bethel and Ai, Bethel and Ai, Bethel and Ai. They're what we would call couplets, so they're twin cities. And then number five, it has to have a militarily significant hill to the north. The Bible says it's there. If there's no hill to the north, then it's not I. Okay, it can't be. So these are the things that we, are, we build before we ever start a dig. We call it a criterial screen. Here is the criteria that we have to sift through our screen to determine if indeed it is the site we think it is. And then there has to be a shallow valley to the north. And let's see if we have these things. Do we have a strategic location? Well, listen to what Joshua 7, 2 says. Now, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, to the east of Bethel. You notice how specific that is? If you're just making up some fairy tale, you're not giving very specific details like that. And he told them, go up and spy out the region. Is it strategic? I think it is. In fact, it's the northern border fortress for the city-state of Jerusalem. And you can see Jerusalem in this picture. Here are the, the uh, towers on the Mount of Olives. So from our side, it's 10 miles away. You've got line of sight with Jerusalem, and they use smoke signals to, to communicate back and forth. So they're a border fortress for the city-state of Jerusalem. So Joshua is not just haphazardly attacking some little site. It's because they're the border fortress and it's right on the line between the city-state of Jerusalem and the city-state of Shechem. Later, when Benjamin and Ephraim have their territories, that's the dividing line still. So you can tell it's an ancient boundary between the territory of Benjamin and the territory of Ephraim to the north. And you can see in <clears throat> criteria two and three that it is near beth Aven and east of Bethel, <clears throat> most likely Elbira, would be Bethel, the house of God. <clears throat> Betin would be Beth Aven. And then you can see our site, Kerbet el Makader. Here is Etel, where Calloway believed that he had evidence. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Etel. Etel is about 50 acres in size, five zero. You want to know how big Jericho was? Nine acres in size, inside the walls. Joshua says, we're only going to send part of the army over there. It's not, it's not a very big place. We don't need to send very many people up there. Well, you got the whole army at Jericho. It's nine acres. You got a 50-acre site at Etel. Do you see a problem there for a Bible reader? 
It's five times bigger than Jericho. Then here's the modern city of Deer Dibwan, some call Beverly Hills of the West Bank. Well, here's our view from the northwest. There's Etel and Kerbet el Makater. All of these sites are in danger. Our site, where we were excavating for 21 years, they were encroaching on it. They're destroying it for agricultural purposes. They're building houses. And so it's, these are why they were literally salvage digs that we were doing. And it was a difficult excavation. We had no water. We had to, no bathrooms, no water. I mean, we have to park at the bottom of a hill, hike up carrying our, gill, our, our gear, hike across a major highway, up another hill, put our stuff down, then go to where we're storing our tools and get all of them and bring it over there. And I mean, before you even start working, you put in a day's work. So it was a challenging dig, but we felt like that's what God had us to do. And so now after all these, you know, 21 years, we're now publishing the results of this. Why? That the world may know that there is a God in Israel. And you can see the sites that I've been mentioning. What about the fourth criteria? Is there an ambush site? Oh, there most certainly is. You're looking at the beautiful Wadi Shaban. The Wadi Shaban is uh, just to the west of Kerbet el Makater, and it's very deep, and Bethel's on one side, I on the other, and there's the ambush site right in between. You could fit, I mean, it is a, you really can't tell here how big this, this Wadi is. You could fit tens of thousands of people down in this easily, they would be concealed. Now, Joshua has part of the army on the north and he's hidden part on the west. So I wanted to find out how long it would take to get from the ambush site to the fortress. So I dropped off four people of military age, uh, two young men and two young women with all of their gear. And I said, okay, I'm gonna time you to see how long it takes. So I dropped them off and I said, don't leave until, you know, you're 10 afters on the button. So I could already be back and waiting. So then I start the clock and it takes them five minutes and 10 seconds at a normal pace carrying gear to get from the ambush site to the fortress. Again, it fits very nicely, doesn't it? We thought we'd have a little fun with it. So when they were coming over the hill, we were videoing them and we had the music to Chariots of Fire as they were coming over the hill. And all this stuff is fun. Then we have a command center to the north. You see that hill to the north? This is Jebel Abu Amar. It's the highest hill in this region, and it is due north of the fortress of Ai. The Bible says there was a hill to the north. I didn't put it there, okay? If there's no hill, then it can't, can't be the site, but there is a hill that's there, and uh, there was a shallow valley called the Wadi El Gai just to the north of us. So again, we see that we're lining up topographically just the way that we would expect. Now, let me digress for a second. We excavated before Kerbet el Makater, we excavated for 20 years at another site called Kerbet Nisia, at a site that we thought might be I, with a criterial screen and all this, and ultimately we determined that it was not. It did not meet the criteria. Now, you gotta have character to admit that you, all we had was a hypothesis, and we're checking our hypothesis, but after investing that much of your life and your resources and your money and your time, and then you say, we checked our hypothesis and it didn't work. That's character. So I laugh when people turn around and say, you guys are fudging on the evidence there at Kerbet el Makater. You're trying to make it fit to be I. If we wanted to just make it fit, we would have done that at Kerbet Nisia. We were out to determine truth, not to be right. Well, we have archeological criteria. It's gotta be smaller than Gibeon. Gibeon's nine or 10 acres in size. Kerbet el Makater's two and a half to four acres in size. So very, looking for a very small site. It has to be fortified in the late bronze one period, LB 1B we would say. So say between 1500 and 1400 BC. There has to be a gate on the north of the site. Now let's think about that for a second. The Bible is very specific. Why do you need that level of specificity if you're giving myths? Why does it matter where it is? A later writer, people tell you the, the Bible wasn't written until the Hellenistic period or during the days of Josiah. How would a later writer know this? It says it's to the north. When we discovered the gate of the city, as you're going to see in just a moment, it wasn't on the east, it wasn't on the south, it wasn't on the, what am I leaving out? Yeah, it was on the north. We didn't put it there. 
Okay, that's where we excavated it. So the hill has to be where the Bible says. It has to be positioned near Beth Avin. The gate has to be where it is, or it's not the right site. Was it destroyed by fire at the end of the late Bronze One period? The Israelites only burned three cities. Remember, God promised them, you're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to occupy cities that you did not construct. So you guys are going to inherit generational wealth, infrastructure, drainage, bridges, roads, fortifications. So they don't, really don't want to burn these cities. It's only Jericho, Ai, and Hatzor that are burned. My friend who's excavating at Hot Sore said, the reason we call it Hot Sore is when you work here, you get hot and sore. It's Hot Sore. Number five, it's left in ruins following the destruction, the Bible says. It is a tel olam in Hebrew. It's a, a heap of ruins. Do we have evidence of these five archaeological criteria? Well, here you can see an overview. This was before drones. This was taken at the beginning of the dig. So this is literally an, an airplane flyover photo. Now we fly drones every day and it's, you know, we don't think anything about it. Oh, it's much smaller than Gibeon. You can see the fortress. You've had the, the drawing here and you can kind of look at the outline of it. Here is the gate complex on the north. And there are four chambers, two on each side. And then we have the fortification wall as it encircles the site that's about four meters wide. It's almost 13 feet wide. That's a very thick wall. Uh, later, they're going to build different structures into the wall. And on top of this, we have a New Testament city, the New Testament city of Ephraim. And those artifacts are out on the hall here, those stone vessels and those coins and all those amazing things. That's all from our New Testament city. I don't have time to tell you about that tonight, but we, we excavate through the New Testament city of Ephraim, John eleven fifty four, 54, in order to get into the Old Testament city of Ai, uh, Joshua 7 and 8. The pottery is key in dating because we don't have coins in that early period. They haven't been invented yet. So most of our dating is based on ceramic typology. And so we studied the pottery constantly and we're able to tell you all the little indicators that allow us to know that. And you can see some of that pottery here. Uh, here's a close-up look at that gate area and some of the adjacent structures, probably a commandante's house here. And here is a place of the, uh, where the scarab is found, which I'm about to tell you about. The socket stones that you're looking at right here, the first one was found here and the second one there. So these two stones came from where those two X's are. So literally X marks the spot. Now, if you haven't gotten goosebumps yet, this would be a good time to do it. The Bible talks about the gate of I and the sockets of I. They're here at your church. They're here, here. I mean, Jesus said in Luke 19, 40, if these people would keep their peace, the stones would cry out and praise me. I mean, if you're listening, they're talking. I mean, they witnessed. I mean, the king of I, once they killed him, they brought him into the gate and brought him there and buried him right there in the gate, covered him up. These guys were there. They're the witnesses of it. Real people, real places, real events. This young lady's name is Destry Jackson. She just graduated from the Bible Seminary with Master of Arts in Biblical History and Archaeology because she was kicked out of the University of Kansas halfway through her master's degree program because she was a Christian. And yes, she probably was talking about it and that didn't bless them. Uh, she had straight A's, I know, because I'm the one who evaluated her transcripts. So she's at a major American university. And if you're a Christian and you talk about it, then you're not welcome there, apparently. And, you know, you think that's the heartland, right? W you know, that's the world that we live in. But Destry <clears throat> is uh, excavating here. Would you say, looking at her, at her face, that she's happy or sad? <laughs> the, this is the most happy I've ever seen Destry, okay? I've been around her a lot. She's got a smile from Dan to Beersheba on her face. Why is she so happy? Because she knows she's just done something really good. And the way she knows she's done something really good, in the last 30 minutes, she's just gotten more attention than she's had in her whole lifetime, okay? The dig directors around her and everybody's taking her picture and talking to her. So she knows she's done something really good. And she did. Because in situ, in the square, without removing it from its original spot, she excavated this. She notified her square supervisor, Dr. Brian Peterson from Lee University, who then notified me, and uh, then it was game on. 
And we knew that this was going to be really important because that scarab is from the time of the conquest. I'll tell you more about it in just a second. But note for now that she found it in situ. We then also dry sift the material in case it's, it's hard to catch things like that. It's so small and it's covered with dirt. It looks like a pebble or something like that. Fortunately, she saw it. Most volunteers would not. We would dry sift even then. You just can't see some things when they're encrusted with dirt. We then wash it. We have a wet sifting station where we wash everything. And now we know that in the past, excavations have been throwing away 75% of the evidence. We go through old dump piles and we're finding more than the archaeologists found. How sad, right, to go to all the expense and trouble. And, I mean, history is on the line. I mean, how we interpret history. And we've been throwing away the evidence. I had somebody tell me, well, they excavated there and it didn't, it didn't sync with the Bible. I said, I guess not when you're throwing away 75% of the evidence. I was going to say, come on, man, but I'd sound like Joe Biden. <laughs> all right. Ooh, okay. Let's talk about our scarab instead. Come on, man. All right. Here is our scarab voted the number one find in Israel in the year 2013. And you think, what in the world is the big deal about this little bitty scarab? Well, since we are in Illinois, when else will I get to use this story? I'll give you a Lincoln story. When Lincoln, who was six foot five, met Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was four foot ten. Of course, her father, Lyman Beecher, was the leader of the Second Great Awakening in America. She came from a very you know, strong family. Her, her brother, Henry Ward Beecher, was the pastor of the largest church in America at the time. But anyway, when he met uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, he condescended to her to shake her hand and said, so you're the little lady who started this great big war, talking about her novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Well, we could say the same thing about this little bitty scarab. It's in the shape of a beetle. That's what scarab means, as beetle. The Egyptians, are you sitting down? The Egyptians believed that the dung beetle pushed the sun across the sky each day. I mean, the, the Greeks, at least, the Greeks were pretty cool. I mean, Apollo hooked up his four horses and pulled the sun across the sky. But where do you come up with the dung beetle pushes the sun across the sky? So anyway, that, that was their belief system. And it has a hole through the middle. It's encased with gold. It can be worn around the neck or on a ring, a pendant. It can obligate, let's say that I have, this is the iconography of a certain Pharaoh. And if he gives me his scarab, it gives me the right to act on his behalf. So it, it's an authority thing that like the king of I may have had. This particular iconography is unique because no previous Pharaoh has ever used that iconography. No future Pharaoh is ever going to use that iconography. Each administration has his iconography. And so we can date absolutely with these things. We know whose scarab is whose, assuming that it has the cartouche and the iconography on there. So I'll, I'll show you in a minute how to, how to read this, but let me just quickly go through the finding of it. Of course, the deeper we go in an archaeological site, the older the material gets. The closer we get to bedrock, the cleaner and the older. We always excavate to bedrock. That's where our best finds are going to be, just above bedrock. Here is bedrock. And sure enough, right above bedrock, we have our scarab right here. Now, the pottery that was found with it, you can see this is first century pottery from the New Testament city. And then below, beneath those flagstones in a sealed locus, we have the late Bronze Age pottery. So the scarab itself is late Bronze Age. That's the time of Joshua. And the, uh, the pottery that, with it, that was with it was as well. All right, so here's our image. And if you look at it, you've got the head of a falcon, the body of a lion, and probably intended to be a griffin of sorts, but it's a morph. It's the, the falcon ruling the sky, the lion ruling the earth. And you can see the tuft on the, the tail of the lion right here. Here's the falcon's head. This symbol is called a netter, N-E-T-E-R. And this is the Egyptian symbol for God or Lord. And then do you see the ankh here, the cross? So the Ankh is the Egyptian symbol for life. So the cross was a symbol for life long before Christianity. So how do we read this? You know, what, what is it saying? What it says is that Pharaoh is Lord of heaven and earth. Can I get a good amen? Uh, I hope not. 
Pharaoh is Lord of heaven and earth, and he is the source of all life. And this is how the Pharaohs, of course, saw themselves, the source of all life. Now, I taught the students earlier in the week how to think in pictures. Being Westerners, this is difficult for us because we want to be very abstract in our language, whereas the Easterner is very concrete in his or her language. The Bible is an Eastern book. So we then, as Westerners, have to learn how to effectively do that. Well, we have to research the parallels. So we go all over Europe, the basement of the British Museum, the published ones, the non-published ones, and there's jillions of scarabs, and we have to look at all of them to make sure that we understand the parallels and that we're dating it correctly. The hard work is not excavation. The hard work is publication. I mean, because we can't make mistakes. Listen, as an evangelical leading the largest dig in the Middle East, if I make a mistake, you know why? Because I'm an evangelical. If someone else makes a mistake, well, we all make mistakes, right? But this has forced us to be excellent. It's forced us to be better. It's a good pressure that, that has come on us to make us be excellent. And so we go through all this and we ultimately determine that this scarab dates to the time of Amenhotep II. You can see those stick legs again, the falcon head. Um, and here's his actual cartouche. So the best fit is Amenhotep II. That happens to be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Mid-15th century, right after Tutmosi III, the most powerful of all the pharaohs is Tutmosi III. He's the pharaoh of the oppression, but the pharaoh of the Exodus is Amenhotep II. Now, I don't have time to get into that tonight, but I have written a chapter in a new book for Zondervan that you can already buy online. And if you buy a copy, my kids will be able to eat. It would be wonderful. Uh, the, the book is entitled Five Views on the Exodus. Stripling, Zondervan, and uh, then you can get all the details on, on this stuff that I'm just touching on right now. Well, chronology is critically important because if we're looking in the wrong place or the wrong time, we're guaranteed to find the wrong stuff. And this is what happens when somebody tells you, well, the Bible's not reliable, either they're in the wrong time, they're two centuries off. A lot of your friends think that, that a lot of your Christian friends think Ramesses II was the Pharaoh of the Exodus because they watched the Ten Commandments. I'm serious. Well, that's not a good reason of how you date things, all right? The Bible gives us an internal chronology. The students learned how to do this this week. And so it's important that we have that. You can see our gate chamber that I've talked about already and the finding of the stones that are there. Here's Gary Byers, my dear friend, who's now our assistant director, discovering those socket stones back in 1995. And that very stone that you're looking at is right here before us tonight, and Gary also has a big smile on his face. The actual gate was not far below the surface, so in season one, I mean, it was pay dirt. You could see immediately what was going on there. Sometimes you've gotta go through many meters of material to, to get to what you're looking for, but in this case, the, the gate was right there. And there's your upper socket stone, and here is our final socket stone, um, in our last days of excavation in 2016, uh, we were able to discover this. It had been in a Bedouin tent where like a shepherd was camped on the site, so we never had access to it. And then the shepherd left, and one of my team members said, hey, what, why don't we turn that stone over and see what it is? And we did, and there was our final socket stone from the gate of eye. Covered with sheep, you know what. All right. The site was destroyed by fire. That red stone means it is calcined. That's the passageway through the gate chamber. And this chamber survived because the later people, listen, later people scavenge earlier building material. It's called secondary usage. And we would have done the same thing. All this building material is lying around and it's hundreds of years old. It means nothing to us. We scavenge it and we use it to build our buildings, except the really heavy stuff, the foundational courses many times are, are left. They save this uh, chamber of the gate and turned it into a wine press. And we actually, we have the vats there and everything from, from their wine pressing. And so here's what happens when your dig architect has too much time on his hands. Uh, he sends me drawings like this. Um, and the, he's put our faces on these people in the wine press and yeah, too much time. This is, uh, was our oldest volunteer at the time, Dr. Oral Collins. He was 88 years old here. And, um, 
supervising a square, and that's the, the fortress wall that he's standing on top of. He died shortly after this. This was his final season in the field. This didn't have anything to do with his death, you understand. But in fact, the dig probably kept him alive. This is what vitalized him uh, for so long. But uh, so, many, so many wonderful people come in, into our lives. Here's the Bronze Age wall. Here's the first century addition to it. And it's like the world's biggest jigsaw puzzle to figure out what fits where and to make sense of it all. And the volunteers get to find all this cool stuff. I mean, supervisors, uh, snoopervisors are just, you know, they're doing paperwork and pretending like they're busy. But I mean, the volunteers are the ones that are seeing things that have never been seen since the biblical period. I mean, we had eight human skeletons out of an olive press cave. And, you know, the, the volunteers, uh, you know, when the first skull became apparent, it turns out they were murder victims, eight murder victims from 2,000 years ago. We solved a 2,000-year-old murder mystery. It's all over the newspapers. Um, that's a whole other presentation for another time. But that, it's the volunteers that get to see that stuff. Now, the volunteer asked me, like, well, will I get credit for this? I said, well, you'll know in your heart that you're the one who found it. <laughs> All right, uh, here's Kerbet O'Makater, left in ruins, certainly as the Bible says. You can see the shepherd passing through every day, bringing in, the sheep and goats are all mixed in together, just like Jesus said. So he brings the, the sheep and the goats through, he's got the sheep dog, and he's got a donkey. I mean, you, you wanna see the ancient and the modern. Here comes the shepherd, he's riding on a donkey, talking on a cell phone and smoking a camel. I mean, it's hilarious, <laughs> hilarious juxtaposition of the ancient and the modern. All right, so you've seen this uh, area before, but the highlighted area is where our infant burial came from. And you can see the square as it begins to be revealed. And here are the grave goods that we found with it, the, the jar, the dipper juglet, and other pieces. When, when I saw this, I mean, we knew there were gonna be bones, that it was gonna be a burial because this is how infants were buried. They had very high infant mortality rates, of course, in the ancient world. And so it's very, very common, sadly, for a, a neonate not to survive. But uh, we excavated it carefully, uh, put the jars back together so that they can tell the story and took it to our anthropologist at Hebrew University. And we partner with six different Israeli universities in different capacities, but Marina is our anthropologist. So we took the bones to her, and, uh, which is kind of weird because she's an anthropologist, which is you study human bones, but because there's this thing about bones in Israel, we, kinda, we had to sneak them into, our, into her lab. How's the anthropologist supposed to study human bones? <laughs> but we don't want any human bones coming in, so we sort of smuggled them in. And uh, Marina did the work for us, and this was how she arranged them. The skull we never found. We assume rodents may have, may have done something with it. Why does this matter? Because the Bible says that there were women living at the fortress of Ai. Now, in a military fortress, why would there be women? I don't know. That's what the Bible says. But here we have a, a neonate, so obviously there were women in the fortress of Ai, as the Bible says. Found out that the Bible's just reliable with these details. Give it a little bit of time. Now, here are our Iron Age ruins with different phases of the Israelite house. And I'm get, going through this pretty quickly because I'm trying to leave time to watch a little video with you guys and then maybe a couple of questions of, that you might have, answer a couple of questions. But here's our Iron Age houses from Kirby El Makader. We actually found those things, the roof rollers and the storage jars and the houses built into the wall there. Very primitive, what I would call phase one of the Israelite house. Then at Shiloh, we have phase two of the Israelite house. It's clearly developing. You have some courtyard structures. And then ultimately phase three of the Israelite house. This is the classic four room uh, house with a barn on the first floor, residential domiciles on the second floor, and then the roof space being used as well. And so if somebody can come help me, we're gonna pull up a video. And while you're pulling it up, I'll answer a couple of questions. Probably the easiest thing to do is to pull it off our school website, thebibleseminary.org and then videos, and then I'll show you which one it is. So while we're pulling it off, uh, getting that ready, anyone have a question? Yes. Uh, when you guys are going and uh, trying to figure out where you want to do an archeological dig, uh, what are the things that like, you end up looking for? Like, why did you guys choose Shiloh? 
what are we looking for when we're trying to determine if we're going to do an archaeological dig? It usually starts with a research question. In our case, we're very interested in the conquest, period. So we're looking at sites that have potential to give us insight on dating the conquest and how the conquest unfolded. So that would be sites like Jericho, Ai, Manibal, Shiloh, and, and so forth. So that's our research area of focus. We then do research to create proposals. We shared the site. We make friends with the local landowners because even if the Antiquities Authority gives you a license, you still have to have permission from the local landowners. So that takes time. You know, the Middle East operates out of relationship. And so you're building relationships and you're also hobnobbing with the Antiquities Authority and doing pre-work and you're raising money and you're training your team, developing your protocols. If you don't have my book, The Trowel and the Truth, Chapter One, I write about all the steps that are required to do that. So if you wanna pick up a copy of my book, that would be great, The Trowel and the Truth. Did we find it? TheBibleSeminary.org and then under videos. Maybe news is where we have the videos. Yeah, TBS videos. And then we're looking for, as you scroll down, what a dig means. All right, one more question while we're pulling that up. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have a lot of, it sounds like a lot of evangelicals are doing a lot of these digs. Do you have as many Israelis that are interested as well that are doing archeological digs? It's not that there are a lot of evangelicals doing digs. There are 3,000 archeological sites in Israel. There's about 100 active excavations and there are maybe three evangelicals who are leading digs, so it's only a small percentage. Now, my dig, which is, happens to be the largest dig, is a, an evangelical group that's leading that, but we partner with all the Israeli universities, so it's not only U.S. groups, but we bring in Ben Gurion University students. They're experts in Flint's, and so their master's students get to work with us, and then they help with the publication. We use the labs at Hebrew University, the scanners at Hebrew University, the pottery labs at, at Ariel University, and the, the zoo archaeologist at Tel Aviv University. So it's very integrated, which is wonderful. That's what we want to do. The, what is the Abrahamic blessing and promise that through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed? I think for too long, Christians, for whatever reason, it's kind of like, you know, that's them and this is us. And uh, I don't see it that way at all. I mean, I want to engage in the arena of ideas. And these people are at the table working with us and, you know, we're sharing and we're learning from them. They're learning from us. And then the new technologies that we're developing, we're just passing on. Yeah, great question. All right, did we find it? Okay, so um, just before we start this video, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, if you wanna find out more about the dig, uh, go to digshiloh.org to follow along with it. We have our own news channel also called Shiloh Network News that you can search and, and, and watch those. And um, my personal website is scottstripling.net if you want to follow there. And uh, then, of course, we'll be in touch with Pastor Jim. And I think we're even going to overlap our trips this summer and talking about other projects that we're going to be able to do. But it's been real fun to be with you guys. This video is a tribute to the oldest volunteer on our dig. His name is Mike Ludini. This summer in the field, he will be 87 when we go into the field this year. He's my dig photographer. And it's no longer like you just have a photographer like it used to be. We have a whole creative team, you know, that puts all this stuff together. But um, Mike is a dear, dear friend. And so this is a tribute to him. It's called What a Dig Means. And if you want to lower the lights, you can. A lot of times people say, well, how long have you been digging here in Israel? I said, well, I came here when the Dead Sea was only sick. <laughs> the ministry of ABR um, really exists to reach three kinds of people. The first would be uh, sort of confronting skepticism that's out there, showing showing people that through our research that the Bible can actually be trusted. The evidence that we've unearthed at the sites that the Associates for Biblical Research has excavated over the last several decades have, I think, given us overwhelming evidence for a synchronism, what I would call a verisimilitude between the archaeological data and the biblical text. It's proof. It's not guesswork. I mean, archaeology today is not like it was several hundred years ago. 
when uh, scholars from Europe came down here and they haphazardly named this city and that city with shoestring evidence. Today, archaeology is at CSI Miami. The Bible gets alive mm. somehow, and I love the Bible mm. and the God of the Bible. One of our main goals here with ABR is to demonstrate the reliability of scripture. By doing the excavation here, we're able to get an overall uh, concept of life in antiquity, and we're able to connect that then to what the scripture says and see the consistency between the Bible and archaeology. I've always sure. been fascinated with what the Bible actually looked like, just not what it was on the page in a story. So to see how walls looked actually and how their pottery looked in real life, that's what really drives me just to see that, to see the Bible come alive. The fact that you can come over here and touch the land that you read about in the Bible, it makes the, the Bible come alive. It helps me to know that it's real. It gives me a connection to people in general to history, to biblical history. It has changed the way I read the text. It has changed the way I teach the text. The archaeology, what it does, it it demonstrates and and to me it, it proves the the reliability of the scriptures. When we see the things that are talked about in the Bible and a material culture that matches that, sometimes with great specificity then I think we can logically conclude that uh, there is a God of the Bible and that that God has a moral claim on our lives. So one might ask, what, why is this work important? Um, there's all kinds of needs that are in the Christian community, people who are sick, people who have gone through tragedy and suffering, people who, who have gone through divorce and have children who have walked away from God. Are, aren't those things more important than doing archaeology? And in a way, those are very interpersonal, but archaeology is important because many people walk away from the faith or never consider the gospel because they believe the Bible is filled with fairy tales or inaccuracies or stories that just aren't true. And that does impact people. And using archaeology as a tool to show that the scriptures can be trusted can be a gateway into someone entertaining, understanding, and receiving the gospel that's given to us in the New Testament. Yeah, you have to have faith, but over here, a lot of that faith is proven to you. Jewish people living here in Shiloh are very, very happy to see that the ground is being taken away, and whatever was in the past is now entering into the present. There is nothing more exciting to me to see people who have come here from the nations and to help us uncover the truth that this incredible holy earth is hiding uh, about what really happened here in Shiloh. There used to be a cartoon about the Wayback Machine. Well, that's what archaeology in Israel is. It's a Wayback Machine. You can go back there. You can live it and touch it. And it's all about the book that you've been reading and studying, the Holy Bible, God's Word. That's great. I'm assuming you all want to go dig, and uh, maybe we'll just cancel the Israel trip and we'll just go dig, you know? Uh, well, I think you need to go to Israel on a tour and then, uh, and then go to Israel on a dig. 
it really would be uh, marvelous if you ever had that opportunity. And uh, Dr. Stripling would give you that opportunity. He'd love to have you come carry boulders and buckets of dirt, <laughs> as I did. And if you want to see me carrying buckets of dirt, I asked one of the leading um, uh, restoration experts in Israel. She actually restored the Jesus boat, uh, Orna Cohen. I got a little interview with her, which I, I guess is rare. And I said, so what do you think? I was sweaty and dusty, and, and it, was, it was terrible TV. But I said, what do you think of my um, archaeology skills? And she goes, um, you need some more work. You know, like, oh, thank you, sweetheart. So um, this is the DVD we filmed with Dr. Stripling, uh, four In Grace episodes that we made into a series. And uh, it's really fascinating on uh, Jericho I. Mountie Ball, and Shiloh. So if you want to get that, that's available for you. Um, but it, it all comes down to the message of Scripture, which they're illuminating, they're verifying. And the, mess the message of Scripture is that we're broken, uh, all of us. Uh, you, you never really find vessels that are perfect, right? Uh, everything is broken, and, and, and what God does is he can repair and, and you have on staff people that that's their expertise. They actually restore these pots and put them all back together. And that's God's expertise. We're all broken. We all need restoration. And God loves us, which is incredible. But he says, you must put your faith in me. You must trust in me, not into a religion, not into a, a priest or a pastor, but in the person and work of Jesus. That's the gospel. That's what the whole Bible is all about. God created us. Everything was good. We messed it up. The whole story from really Genesis 3 on is all about redemption. Jesus, the Son of God, coming into Israel, uh, living perfect life, dying there, rising from the dead. He's alive. That's the story of Christianity, real Christianity. And that offer of salvation is available to you. And then once you have received by faith Jesus, then you have uh, now the Spirit of God indwelling you, and now, day by day, we can learn to walk by the power of the Spirit of God, and He uh, continues to help uh, mold us and make us to the uh, vessels of honor that He wants you to be in your life. So I love archaeology. It is it's fascinating to me, and I hope that uh, you were blessed tonight by Dr. Stripling. We thank you for coming and for presenting this to us.